my very great pleasure indeed to introduce our keynote speaker, Keith Brown, who is an associate professor at the Thomas J. Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University. I first met Professor Brown in Macedonia. I think it was in 1992, wasn't it? Something like that. And he came up to me and said, I hear you're coming to Chicago. I just, I don't know, I was in North Carolina at the time. Rumors traveled very fast indeed. In Macedonia, I think. Yeah, especially in Macedonia. <laughs> um, uh, Keith wrote his uh, master's thesis uh, in 91 on Khrushchevo 1903, the Integrative Revolution, Greek nationalism in a Macedonian town, and then his PhD was of meanings and memories, the national imagination in Macedonia, where he did extensive field work in Khrushchevo. That dissertation resulted ultimately in a significantly um, revised, advanced, new and different book. The Past in Question, Modern Macedonia and the Uncertainties of the Nation, Princeton 2003. Um, it also has uh, authored Macedonia's Child Grandfathers, The Transnational Politics of Memory, Exile and Return, 1948 to 1998. He is the editor of a number of collections, including Transacting Transition, The Micropolitics of Democracy, Assistance in the Former Yugoslavia, which came out just last year. The Usable Past, Greek Metahistories, which he co-edited with uh, Yanis Hamilakis in um, 2003. And Ohrid and Beyond, A Cross-Ethnic Investigation into the Macedonian Crisis, which uh, was published in 2002. He's edited a uh, special issue of History and Anthropology, he has numerous chapters in books and articles, and uh, we're very, very happy to have him here today uh, for our conference as our keynote speaker, and he's going to give a talk entitled Baltimore Drowning, a Slavic Metahistory of Global Proportions. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Thanks. I'm actually, I'm a, now a micro-historian rather than a meta-historian. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, um, Meredith and Andy, um, and especially Victor for putting this together. It's a, it's a great conference and it's great to see so many uh, people um, from the past and the future, I hope. Uh, back in 1995, I published a paper. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read this just because I don't want to go over time. And I should say at the beginning, I got special dispensation to break the Macedonian state um, frame from, from Victor ahead of time. So don't be alarmed. <laughs> So back in 1995, I published a paper on the meaning of Macedonian jokes, which opened with one of my favorites, the punchline to which is at an international conference on penguins, the Macedonian scientific delegation offers a paper with the title, Penguins and the Macedonian National Question. Now, as so often, a Macedonian joke has wider resonance. Citizens of small nations have a lot in common with academic area specialists in general, and anthropologists in particular we have a tendency to make everything in the world about us and our interests. And in this paper, what I want to do is invert that tendency to argue in the spirit of Victor's framing this morning um, and his comments about global connection, uh, to argue that Macedonia is a good site to understand everything in the world. I acknowledge that this is perhaps an uh, overreach, um, especially because, as people say, I'm the only thing between you and your dinner. But um, let me start. So I've been especially inspired lately by a new wave of ethnographies of global connection, uh, among which, in particular, Anna Singh's Friction, uh, which bears that title, is, is I think, one of the, the uh, sort of leading examples. Contemporary Macedonia, I think, offers the prospect for similar experiments in multi-sited transnational anthropology. And a recent case for study of this kind would be the execution of three Macedonians from Kumanovo in Iraq in August 2004, by Islamic insurgents. Now, the three men were hired by Sufan Engineering, which was contracted by Kellogg, Brown, and Root. And the three were part of a larger group of Macedonians who were paid $1,500 a month each to build bases for US soldiers. A Krista Liso, a um, journalist based in Skopje, uh, interviewed one of the Macedonians who, survived, who returned safely, Lyubcho Kuzmanovsky, who said in the interview, there were maybe 600 to 800 Macedonians, 400 from Brown and Root alone, a lot of those people from Kumanovo and Skopje. Other people from places like Negotino and Kavadarci are there now. In a different base, I was told, was a German-owned company called Ecolog from Tetovo, 
which employed Albanians, and they drove garbage trucks. And in Al-Assad base, from where we would finally leave in October, was a Hungarian company for which many Macedonians worked cleaning toilets. So here we, we see a sort of uh, an image of the organization of nationalities in Iraq, the employment of people from one area of US military contracting to another, and the role of multiple intermediaries, in this case, uh, Sufan's frontman, uh, a somewhat shadowy figure named uh, Sergio Tanguma. Um, all of these factors combine to make this incident uh, revelatory of wider patterns of international relations. Now the question that actually comes off something Susan said in her last comments just now, are such patterns wholly new? There are some who say the scale and pace of transnational connections now are qualitatively different from those of the past, but others still see force in the once canonical statement of Maitland's recirculated by Evans Pritchard that anthropology must choose between being history and being nothing. Though Evans Pritchard turned the Bon Mot on its head, he also offered an initial sketch of which kind of history uh, he saw as having the greatest affinity for anthropology. He named Maitland, uh, Vinogradov, Vinogradov, Pirenne, Bloch, Lucien Fevre, and Glotz. And in the same section, he characterizes their view as being that history is not a succession of events, it is the links between them. And so here I want to argue for the potential of a particular kind of history, uh, microhistory in this case, to aid anthropologists in their contemporary work of understanding and illuminating global connections by studying past events which uh, may appear unique uh, but turn out to be expl explicable only through larger systems of meaning. But before I do that, I want to take a short detour back into social scientific Macedonia-focused history to give um, some context to this talk and reveal that I, I, I have a lingering commitment to the work of those fictional penguin scholars. So I'm not going to unpack this, and I don't want to scare you, but uh, this is uh, what I'm trying to do is trace out the contours of what I think was a complex transnational system um, in around 1900 to 1910, in which through the workings of a form of mercantilism originally driven by US industrial interests, property in Macedonia got redistributed, a substantial proportion of the population had direct experience of the downside of capitalism, and as a result, Macedonian national activism took a decided left-wing turn with substantial consequences for the country's fate through the rest of the 20th century. The project then does not sever all ties with a Macedonia-centered puzzle, which identifies a particular form of crossroads for the region in 1920, when the Communist Party received 33% of the vote in the territory as a whole, and scored even higher in the region around Bitola, which is my particular area of interest. I'm still at work exactly on, on how MPO and Vumro uh, play into this history. Um, and, but, and this is a sort of initial attempt to sort of map out some of the connections between a sort of Macedonia side of, of things going on and how to weave this transnational uh, part uh, that I'm interested in. And so it's the, if you like, it's the bottom right-hand quadrant here that I'm talking about primarily today. Now the evidence, uh, the source materials for this, this kind of connection, um, for, for the connections between the US and Canada and Macedonia in this period varies. Um, author Stoyan Christo wrote in 1939 uh, from his own experience of migration from Aegean Macedonia that, quote, America became the most vital factor in the lives of the villagers more so than their fields and meadows. Uh, the life histories of Macedonian pensioners in the 1940s and 50s that I've written about before, where many of them, a surprising number, recount their travels to and from North America as part of a, a career of activism. Uh, reports commissioned by the U.S. Senate, published in 1911, uh, which include references to Macedonian political refugees, quotes, obnoxious to the Turkish government for taking part in the revolution of 1903. Uh, and th the same report notes that some of the more intelligent um, organized and conducted a Macedonian revolutionary organization which was affiliated with similar organizations in other parts of the United States, and the general direction of which was centered at New York. And finally, the work of Robert Harney, um, Canadian uh, historian who described the system that made possible a woman's journey from Bobishta uh, to Toronto. And back in 1977, that is long before the transnational, transnationalism movement within anthropology gained ground, wrote about the network that got her there. Like any good communication system, its strength cannot be measured by mule trips, railway schedules to Salonika, ships passages to the Piraeus and to Marseille, immigrant hotels and Cunard arrangements, 
but rather by the intensity and ease of flow of goods, people, and news throughout the network. Remittances, prepaid passages, savings, wives, brides-to-be, komitaji with a Turkish price on their heads, migrants and returnees, passed back and forth from the Macedonian hinterland to Toronto, Chicago, and Detroit as if they formed a single society. So I'm interested in the story of this flow that encompassed Macedonia and North America in the early 20th century. And Hani is interested in the Macedonian side that is not strictly in Macedonia, but the, the extent of Macedonian agency in this, uh, in this network. But I want to uh, get at the empirical details on the US side um, and the, 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 the sort of wider forms of agency involved and look at the depth, breadth, and texture of the US connections and how they were created. And in this regard, I depart slightly from Hani's judgment on the limitation of examining immigrant hotels and Cunard schedules uh, because he had oral history available to him writing in 1977 about the 1920s. The period I'm interested in, oral history is no longer an option. Uh, 1900 to 1910, and so some of that documentary work is needed. I do share, though, the commitment to uh, qualitative narrative microhistory. It is, of course, congenial to anthropologists with its close links to the kind of locally embedded ethnography uh, that Cl Clifford Gertz made famous. Uh, microhistory pioneered by Carlo Ginsberg similarly focuses in tight on some slice of life from the past in Ginsberg's paradigmatic case a Miller's trial on a charge of heresy, where he laid out his worldview. And then microhistory uses this to illuminate much broader truths about the society and culture from which that slice of life comes. So, uh, so now I get going with the, with the talk. Uh, so 100 years ago, uh, coming up in three weeks, the New York Times reported that on Saturday, April 27th, 1907, a section of the new pier being erected at the uh, immigration station at Locust Point, South Baltimore, for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad for the use of the North German Lloyd Steamship Company, collapsed today, carrying down upward of 50 men, of whom six are known to be dead and 15 injured. The Baltimore Sun gave a little more detail in a story published the same day entitled Huge Pier Falls with 30 Men. Among the missing uh, were three African-American whitewashers, William Vaughan, Buddy Williams, and George Montgomery, who had been at the far end of the pier when it collapsed. A rumor circulated that 40 Polish working men were dead, but it turned out that they were, quotes, assembled in brotherly concord in a nearby saloon. <laughs> Moored at the next pier, a North German Lloyd ship, the Cassell, began to roll heavily. The story read as follows. Two men in the steerage, fearing the ship was going to capsize, made for the gangway that led ashore, and which was some distance across a space between the Cassell and the pier. As they had gotten safely on the gangway, it dropped from the pier, and both men were soon floundering in the water. Uh, so this, this serves as the peg for the three connected stories that drive the title for this paper, Baltimore Drowning, A Slavic Microhistory, and Global Proportions. So two men floundering in the water. So who drowned? Baltimore Drowning. Well, I'm going to take cinematic license and cut away from the two steerage passengers floundering in the water to focus back on the pier. It was, by all accounts, an impressive structure, 1,000 feet long, 160 feet wide, two stories high. The pier was being constructed with a reported budget of either $400,000 or $750,000, depending on which paper you read. The difference in budgets may well have arisen from the fact that $300,000 was being channeled through contractors. When completed, it was to have been the largest square feet of wharfage of any pier in the world. Now, why, one might ask in Baltimore in 1907. Part of the answer lies in the consolidation of capital enterprises that was so much a part of the American finance scape of the 1900s. As the New York Times noted, it was a joint venture of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and the North German Lloyd Steamship Company. The uh, latter was formed by Hermann Meyer in 1857 and had been operating immigrant shipping between Bremen and Baltimore since 1868. Fast steamers were introduced in the mid-1880s as part of an emergent rivalry between uh, both among different German lines, in particular North German Lloyd and the Hamburg America line, but also as Bismarck continued the consolidation of German national unity under Prussian leadership between German and British companies. In the 1890s, North German Lloyd, I'm going to continue with this theme of gigantism, just so you know. So North German Lloyd was the largest steamship company in the world. In 1902, it sent uh, 81,000 emigrants from Bremen and another 29,000 from its Mediterranean ports, roughly twice as many as its leading British and French competitors. 
Baltimore and Ohio Railroad uh, was in less good shape at this point um, through it, it, its relationship in, with its rivals w was, uh, was less uh, dominant. Um, in particular, in the 1870s, Standard Oil used its financial power to secure rebates from the Baltimore and Ohio on the transportation of oil. So it's, so it's already cutting deals with, with larger organizations at this point and losing revenue as a, as a result. In the 1890s, the railroad went bankrupt in attempts to compete with the B Pennsylvania Railroad. And in the same period, um, U.S. business barons, most notably J.P. Morgan, were seeking to build conglomerates that would yield financial synergies. An obvious field was to link railroads and steamship companies and uh, thus cut transaction costs through uh, what were called uh, through bills of lading. Having acquired two major British lines, Leyland and White Star, by 1901, J.P. Morgan tried to forge such a trust with the Pennsylvania Railroad. And the cooperation between North German Lloyd and the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad had the same aim. The pier was to include two train tracks on each level and to allow the, uh, the transfer of cargo straight from ship to train. And in 1907, as the location of the new pier indicates next to the immigration station, that cargo was human. 1907 marked the high water tide of immigration to the United States. Uh, 1,285,349 people reportedly entered uh, the states that year. Now, Ellis Island was the main entry point, but Baltimore was, was, a, was growing as, a, as an alternative for reasons that I'll go into later. And North German Lloyd had the lock on uh, Baltimore. So the new pier was, uh, if you like, capital incarnate. And as one might expect at a time in US history where observers and participants, including uh, President Theodore Roosevelt and authors H.G. Wells and Upton Sinclair, all stressed the tensions of capital and labor, the workers paid the price. It's no coincidence that those at work on a Saturday on the pier at a time when, according to subsequent investigative journalism, some managers had already seen signs of dangerous subs um, subsidence and urged evacuation were African Americans. It's also striking that there was little or no attention to safety or keeping track of workers in case of accident. The McLean Company, one of the uh, subcontractors, which reportedly uh, was the main employer of the Polish uh, working men, refused to hold a roll call to identify the missing, instead uh, indicating that, that that information would come out on payday uh, May 2nd for the casualized labor, so whoever didn't show up, they would figure was probably dead. Although the main frame of the journalist accounts is of natural tragedy, there's a subtext of capitalism gone awry in tune with some of the concerns of the time. But the Poles were not the Slavs I'm going to focus on in this Slavic microhistory. The um, SS Kassel, the North German Lloyd ship moored beside the pier, had sailed on April 11th from Bremen with around 1,800 passengers on board. The largest number were Germans, listed as Germans on the passenger manifests, uh, of which this is one page which you can't actually make much sense of, but this is again a, a, the, the sort of raw data I'm drawing on. But the ship also boasted um, people identified under the category people or race, which was one of the statistics collected by the immigration service. The ship had Magyars, Bohemians, Italians, uh, Hebrews uh, or Jews, and a host of Slavs, including Montenegrins, Croatians, Russians, Ruthenians, Moravians, Slovaks, and Poles. And the largest single group among the Slavs, numbering around 380, was made up of men from Ottoman Turkey, and specifically from Macedonia, identified sometimes as Macedonians, sometimes as Serbians, sometimes as Bulgarians. But these are also not the subject of the Slavic microhistory. So I want to turn away again cinematically from the ship and uh, go to the immigration station where by an accident of history's traces we can identify one more Slav. Um, among the people working there was a young man named John Gogurovich. Um, his personnel file indicates he was a first generation immigrant born in Ragusa, that is modern Dubrovnik, in 1871. Uh, he self-identified as Croatian. He studied three years of medicine at the University of Vienna in Austria before coming to the United States. He had taken the civil service examination for interpreter in February 1902 and was appointed to serve on Ellis Island in April of the same year. Uh, and um, let me just skip over this. Well, it, but he, he basically was having a stellar career at this point. He was promoted very quickly after being hired. He passed the examination for immigrant inspector in spring 1906 and was appointed to that rank in October 1906. He listed his languages, sorry, he listed his languages as Croatian, Slovenian, Serbian, Italian, German, Servo-Gypsy, and Macedonian. 
And in the official record, his languages were listed as Croatian, German, Italian, Slovenian, Serbian, Spanish, Polish, Bohemian, Slovak, and as knowing the dialects, Macedonian and Gypsy. So we know Gogurovic was at work that day. Just have a couple of shots. This, these are actually pictures from Ellis Island taken in 1903. So it's possible that one of these people is him. The, this, is, the, this is a shot of inspectors in Ellis Island taken in 19, uh, 1903. He transferred to Baltimore in 1905. And this is Ellis Island's track. Uh, this, is, this is just a, to give you a sense of what immigrants had to face when they came into one of these stations. Uh, this is a nicely sort of marked arrow route of where they, where they pass through out to the railroad station on the other side. So this is the transition point uh, to the US. Uh, we know Gogurovich was at work that day in Baltimore because in among the other papers in his personnel file is a collection of correspondence grouped under the cover page concerning Inspector Gogurovich's alleged insubordination during the collapse of the pier at Locust Point. Uh, the correspondence was triggered by a letter from the White House uh, from William Loeb, secretary to President Roosevelt, um, who reported that an immigrant, another immigrant inspector at Baltimore, General J. Edwin Brown, uh, felt that further investigation was required. And we don't know what Brown's letter said. I haven't found it yet. Uh, but um, the letter is to um, the Secretary of Commerce and Labor, Os Oscar Strauss, who then writes to the commissioner in Baltimore um, asking for um, a full report with testimony taken under oath. And this was a time when government actually functioned in this way. Um, and so two days later, Weiss wrote back in closing two reports, Gogorovich's own handwritten account and a typed report from his superior Bertram Stubb, Stump. I'm sorry. And I'm going to just read you these two accounts and then talk about the two of them. So Gogorovich writes as follows. At the time when the disaster occurred, I happened to be not far from the door of the doctor's room and hearing many persons crying and yelling, the new pier is going down. Through natural impulse, I looked through the window. Close to me and at the same window was watchman George N. Stewart. I saw the SS Cassell heavily leaning to one side and listing until the bridge connecting her with the pier went down and dragged along a Bulgarian immigrant who happened to be a passenger for Galveston. The man went down for a moment and came again to the surface with uplifted hands, then went down again and came up repeatedly. I saw that the man was going to drown and being myself a good swimmer and having already saved people from drowning, I ran from the window to the elevator and then down to the first floor with the intention of jumping into the water and saving the man. When I came downstairs, I found that a stevedore had succeeded in throwing a rope around the man's body and with the help of others was dragging him ashore. I immediately returned upstairs to my post and was asked by you why I left the floor. He's writing this to the commissioner, uh, to which I answered by explaining as above. To prove that I left the floor for said purpose, I beg to state that in running towards the elevator, I hurriedly took off my coat and turned it over to matron Miss N. Irvine. And I believe that I also told her that I expected to jump into the water to save a drowning man. I do not remember that I was ordered not to leave the floor. I may have been excited seeing a man about to lose his life, that I did not hear any orders to that effect, which if I had, I would surely have obeyed them. I had constantly before my eyes a man struggling in the water and did not see or hear anything else. I also beg to say that when the disaster had occurred, very many people were yelling and clamoring, and maybe, sorry, and maybe that that noise prevented me to hear orders. I hope that Watchman G and Stewart and matron MS, uh, Miss N. Irvine will corroborate my above statement as far as they saw and heard me. Stump, his superior, wrote the following. Suddenly, without previous warning, our pier number nine shook as if struck by an earthquake, and for a few moments there was considerable excitement among the aliens on our pier. The inspectors were at their desks and were told by me to keep their places and continue registration, as I thought it to be the best way to prevent excitement and confusion. Inspector Gogurovich left his desk and went over to one of the windows, came back and reported to me that he had seen several steerage passengers, who were his countrymen, jump from the deck of the steamship Cassell into the water. They were drowning and he was going down to rescue them. I told him to go back to his desk and that was his place, and we had all we could do to attend to our own people without causing additional excitement. He hesitated a moment, then put on his hat and told me he must go, he could not stay, that he was going to rescue those people. I then said that if he did so, it would be in direct disobedience of orders. You were in the boardroom, and I immediately reported the matter to you. This again, writing to the commissioner. Within 10 minutes, Gogurovich returned to his post, and I believe was exceedingly sorrow, sorry for what he had done. In my judgment, the man acted under the impulse of the moment, he being highly excited at the time. The four aliens who jumped overboard from the steamship Cassell were saved by stevedores and officers on board that ship. Now, there are a number of compelling elements to these dueling accounts, one of which I suspect 
was written after its author had seen the other. I believe that Gagurovich saw Stump's uh, letter. Most striking, apart from the breakdown of grammar at the end of Gagurovich's letter, is their well-craftedness. As Natalie Zeman Davis compellingly argues in her fiction in the archives, uh, one can read appeals for clemency from the French king as well-told tales which simultaneously reveal something of their author's station and worldview. Stump, uh, who I suspect had never experienced an earthquake, nonetheless compares the feeling to that of an earthquake, which I take as an index of his reading media accounts of what he had just experienced and borrowing their language. His report in general has a stolid flavor which presumes the value of stability and routine. The appropriate response, he argues, was to carry on. In this short description, he uses the word excitement three times, confusion once. Implicitly, he criticizes the steerage passengers, whom he later calls aliens, a term he uses five times in the text of the letter, for their own overreaction in, quotes again, jumping overboard from the Cassell. He also calls Gagurovich himself excited, yet there's a tactical malice in the letter as well. For not only was his reaction to Gagur Gagurovich's departure immediate reporting to his superior, he ran into the boardroom to tell tales, um, he also slyly asserts will and therefore deliberate defiance into two of Gagurovich's actions, taken after the few moments of excitement on the pier. First, Gagurovich disobeys by going to the window, and then after a direct order to return to his post, even hesitates before going downstairs. Evidence in Stump's mind that he was not just swept up by the drama of the moment, as is, uh, at, at, um, he's not just swept up by the drama of the moment and reasserting his determination to go. And this is also the fact that in Stump's account, he stops to put on his hat. Gogurovich admits that he may have been excited, and that's where I think you can see that, he, that uh, the commissioner has shown him Stump's letter. Um, the, and, and also the particular phrasing he uses to describe the man he says he saw in the water, he says he happened to be Bulgarian. And this formulation first suggests to a reader that at the time he could not have known the race or nationality of the man in the water. But it second makes the point, again, I think somewhat slyly, that their common Slavic heritage hardly made them fellow countrymen, as, uh, as uh, Stump asserted. Ragusa being removed from Bulgaria and Macedonia by several days' travel of a different dominant religion and script and at least one state frontier. And third, supports the larger claim of Gagurovich's version that this was a case of universal fellow feeling. He does not deny a connection with the steerage passenger, uh, but he recasts this connection as a product of shared humanity in the face of the ultimate enemy, death. And the letter, I think, has its, its own cinematic, tight cinematic focus on one individual, and it sharpens this sense, demanding of the reader that they look through Gagurovich's eyes and see not a panicky, excitable alien who put themselves in danger, but a human being sucked into the water by forces beyond anyone's control. So where Stump's account stretches out the time of Gagurovich's experience, moving from desk to window to stump to hesitation to downstairs, Gagurovich's account compresses it, in his account, he was already at the window and ran from there to the elevator. He did not stop to, to, to put on his hat. He took off his coat on the run. At the same time, his narrative populates the space in which the action takes place, naming two other witnesses, both uh, notably junior employees of the service, who could, if pressed, corroborate his account. Uh, now, the two letters get forwarded, and, and basically no further action is taken. So, the, so, it, so, it, so it ends there. The, this particular issue ends with these letters. There's no official reprimand. Um, sorry, there, there is an official, there's a reported reprimand, but in fact, Gagurovich then gets a pay rise later in the year. Um, he's seconded to do uh, sensitive work uh, later that year, um, and he transfers in 1911 to the Department of Justice at a, at a higher salary. Uh, on, on, the, on the case of his leaving, um, the Commissioner General writes that his loss is a source of regret as his ability is held in high regard. But the Commissioner of Baltimore is rather less effusive. This is in 1911, who says, I wish to say that he has always shown a willingness to perform the duties assigned him and has discharged them in a competent and painstaking manner. He is a linguist of marked ability and his severance from the Bureau of Immigration, I feel, will be a loss not only to this station, but to the service at large. He carries with him the best wishes of this office 
and in view of his native ability and linguistic accomplishments, there is no reason to doubt his success in the new field upon which he is to enter. I see this as a somewhat lukewarm uh, sending, send off, and it's signed by um, Bertram Stump, who actually, after 1907, also prospers. He becomes commissioner at Baltimore in 1910, and it may be that his becoming commissioner prompted, uh, um, partly prompted Gagurovich's leaving. In May 1911, his efficiency report for Gagurovich uh, gives him a score of 98% for efficiency um, and uh, calls him an all-round capable officer. But the kicker and the legacy of April 1907 comes under the remarks section where Stump writes, while Inspector Gagurovich is an especially well-equipped immigration officer, he has an excitable temperament which at times impairs his judgment. Now, the written record shows once, not at times. Um, impairs judgment, and that is a matter of judgment on which it appears Stump and at least his immediate superior Weiss disagreed. So Gogurovich received commendation from every other senior official from, from, for whom he worked, including the Attorney General later. Uh, he was friendly with the watchman and the matron at Baltimore. So he, we have a situation in which a young, energetic, able, foreign-born immig immigration inspector with experience all across the United States in a range of capacities, in all of which he appears to have excelled, fell foul of two immediate superiors, Stump and Brown, one of whom was personally connected to the private secretary of the president. Bertram Stump's personnel records, it uh, makes somewhat interesting reading. Um, he's also in, you can also track him down in the US census. Uh, his father, gentleman, living with uh, his paternal uncle, Herman Stump, he was educated by a tutor, and then his pathway to the Immigration Bureau was through work from 1891 to 1895 as a clerk for the House of Representatives Committee on Immigration and Naturalization. Uh, he was appointed to the Bureau uh, in 1895, that is, before competitive examinations. He lists no knowledge of foreign languages. His file and other information contain other clues of a well-connected life of patronage and ties to capital. The 1870 census lists his uncle's estate at a value of $30,000. An April uh, 1911 letter of support for promotion indicates friends in high places, as does a reference to a vacation he took at a friend's camp on Upper Saranac Lake in the Adirondacks in 1919. And then prior to his work in the House of Representatives in 1891, he actually worked in the office of Mr. Garrett, president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company. And in 1920, uh, he reports in his own language dealing robustly with, quotes, anarchists and parlor Bolsheviks. So I haven't tracked down the records for Edward Brown, the other uh, accuser of, um, of uh, Gagurovich, but I anticipate a similar picture. Appointment to the Bureau in a time of patronage or lax standards, um, little or no uh, knowledge of other languages, and perhaps some of the language of nativism and class consciousness that gained ground in the face of the so-called new immigration of the late 1890s and early 20th century, in which Im migrants from the Balkans, including the 380-odd Macedonians and Bulgarians aboard the Cassell on their way to Galveston were a major part. Stump could not or did not choose to see any difference between a university-educated polyglot Croat from an Adriatic seaport with a distinguished history and a Bulgarian workingman. Gogurovich, of course, also blurred the difference in his invocation of a shared humanity, but for Stump they were joined in their alienness, their excitability, and one might argue their non-American Balkanness. So that's the Slavic microhistory, and uh, I hope points to a wider cult uh, set of cultural dimensions regarding nativism, anti-Slavic prejudice, and the relationship of industry, immigration, and democracy in early 20th century America. But I'm going to take a final cinematic swoop, because I know you want to know what happened, to the Cassell and the one, two, or four, depending on the eyewitnesses, uh, men floundering in the water. I'm inclined to trust Gogorovich's opinion to the limits of his ability to distinguish South Slavic dialects on the language they spoke. My sense, though, is that we'll, the name of the man he ran downstairs to rescue is irretrievable. Uh, so therefore, so is the exact start and end of the journey that that individual was taking. And this is the last sort of global proportion I want to take out of this. So the Cassell was... Um, a crossroads in its own right, where migrants from different empires and nations travel together in the steerage. In some sense, it represents an industrial age version of the role played by ships of the slave economy of the Atlantic described by Paul Gilroy in 
in, the black, in his book, The Black Atlantic, as the living means by which the points within the Atlantic world were joined. They were mobile elements that stood for the shifting spaces in between the fixed places that they connected. They need to be thought of as cultural and political units rather than abstract embodiments of the triangular trade. The ships then in the industrial period were the key link in a chain of connection uh, by which, to quote an author from 1927, American capital set out to discover new sources of labor and to that purpose ransacked the very ends of the earth. So this story uh, can be told uh, in a different register in the document traces of the 1800 and 25 passengers who boarded the Cassell in Bremen. They were all registered on the ship's manifest, running to about 68 pages, with about 30 travelers on each. Around 300 disembarked in Baltimore, and the rest, including the men from the water and all those who listed their place of origin as Macedonia, traveled a further 1,200 miles by sea to the seas, ship's final destination, uh, Galveston, Texas. Now, North German Lloyd began running steamship lines to Galveston in May 1905. Um, and this is dis uh, the, the history of this particular r route is described by the inspector in charge at Galveston in 1908 who said, beginning in the early spring of 1905, there was considerable agitation over the south and southwest in, on account of the great scarcity of labor on the farms, in the factories, and in fact, the entire industrial life of those sections. And about that time, presumably in response to this agitation, the North German Lloyd Steamship Company began to bring a hitherto unknown class of aliens to this port consisting chiefly of Bulgarians and Macedonians. These aliens had all been farm laborers in their native lands and were so classed upon their arrival here. Um, yeah, so, so Galveston is, is, this, is this site of uh, entry uh, for this new class of aliens, as it's put in 1908. Um, and North German Lloyd has a presence there. They have a, an office uh, located close to the wharf. Um, in 1910, and this goes back to, to an earlier point and a later one, uh, uh, in 1910, a federal immigration official reported that Galveston had a reputation in Europe as being particularly lax in its immigration control, which actually stimulated immigration to the city. Um, and this is also borne out by literature from Missler's office collected in the course of an investigation by another immigrant inspector, John Gruenberg, in late 1908. Um, when he was, he was instructed by the Immigration Bureau to look into what was then being referred to as the traffic in working men, especially from uh, Macedonia. Uh, so this actually, yeah, this is the, just a quick um, filmic version of the, uh, of, the, of the journey that these folks are taking then on the Cassell. So a bunch of them start in Veles, that's the, the name place of origin of several of these 380. They go overland to Bremen, they go across the ocean, uh, 4,000 miles, they arrive in Baltimore at the piers, and then they continue going round to uh, Galveston, Texas. So I'll take you that far. Um, in his report in 1908, Gruenberg estimated that in the years 1904-1907, uh, F. Missler, that is this, this um, agent with an office in Galveston, also in Bremen, um, sold roughly 35% of the total number of steamship tickets purchased in Bulgaria, 7,000 out of 20,000. And in Macedonia, 20,000 out of a total of 59,000. This is in the period uh, 1904 to 1907. And that overall, he handled 45% of North German Lloyd's trade in Europe. He operated through sub-agents, including Bogomir Jakic in Belgrade and Emanuel Krapf in Monastir and later Thessaloniki. And according to Gruenberg's analysis, and this is borne out by other analyses, the business was based around Missler pumping capital into the region through his sub-agents which then allowed them to advance would-be immigrants the cost of their tickets, usually against promissory notes at high rates of interest, which were backed by their property in Macedonia. So this is the, this is the problem that concerns the Immigration Bureau. So like they understand that, that, uh, that, that migration happens, but they don't really understand why suddenly there are all these people coming from Macedonia and Bulgaria. And the answer they find is in this credit system uh, being operated by these agents. Uh, so... Yeah, so as I said, the, the largest single point of origin for the 380 was Veles. Um, I'm having a hard time deciphering the, the manifest, as you can see, and, and this, Veles is an area where I don't know the village name so well, but uh, there are some from uh, Gernchiste, which is a, a village close to Veles, and I suspect the others are in the same general area, because that would conform with what, again, the immigration officials tell us, that the, the way this trade works is that the agents sort of... Uh, 
uh, have divided this part of the world into sections and they will mine a particular section at a particular point in time and they'll, they'll kind of flood it with advertisements and offers of capital and then move on to the next one later. The destinations of the 380 uh, on the Cassell included St. Louis, Missouri, uh, San, Fr San Francisco, Lincoln, Nebraska, Jasper, Wyoming, Trinidad, Colorado, um, and Durant in what was then the um, Oklahoma Territories. The biggest two contingents, though, were inscribed in the manifest as heading for two locations closer at hand. Beaumont, Texas, um, which 90 men gave as their final destination, and uh, Leslie, Arkansas, given by 120 as their final destination. So in both of these cases, I've realized these are in the wrong order. This is what I want. So this is the kind of uh, information that Missler was putting out um, uh, in, in the Bulgarian language, uh, and this is included in one of Grunberg's uh, reports, in the, in the attractions of, of particular ports. Uh, so this is you know, why, why Galveston is so, so great, because you don't need to show an address. Um, and then this is a letter uh, Grunberg writes to Jakic posing as a, as a would-be immigrant and gets this letter back from Jakic saying, yes, I'm, I can guarantee you entry, in this case via Baltimore. You, know, you don't have to worry, uh, and we'll, we'll get you in. So in both cases, um, so in both the cases of the, we'll come back to those in a minute, but I want to go back to this. So in both these cases of going to Leslie, Arkansas and Beaumont, Texas, uh, the, the, um, the manifest confirms Missler's promise uh, that addresses were not needed. So the usual form of immigration was uh, you had to provide the name of a relative um, or friend in a particular place. Uh, bef to, on, on the original manifest, it couldn't be a company or, or a firm. It had to be a, a named individual, and this was because... Uh, immigrants basically face this double bind of having to dodge the constraints of the, the law about, uh, uh, that classified people as liable to become a public charge, which meant if you, if, the, if you didn't have a sign that you knew where you were going and you were going to work, then you would be excluded because you were going to be a public charge. You weren't going to help the economy. But if you, if you were too specific, if you named a company and said, yes, this company has given me a, a contract to come and work, a promise, then you would be uh, deported under the alien contract labor law uh, because you couldn't be, they weren't allowed to do this because the unions uh, and, and labor in, in the U.S. had actually managed to lobby successfully to make sure this didn't happen. So in theory, you shouldn't be able to give, uh, as, as these guys did, um, the names of, of, of particular companies. So in Leslie, Arkansas, it was, um, uh, the, the name given was a, a firm called Banks and Joseph, uh, but they get through, and this confirms Missler's sort of promise that Galveston is, is easy. Now, what, it, what was Banks and Joseph? I, I haven't done the documentary connection yet, but it seems likely that the firm either was or had close connections with what was at the time, and now I'm going back to gigantism, I'm afraid, the world's largest whiskey barrel factory, uh, which employed almost 2,000 people, 600 of them cutting wood for the barrels. And, and there, are, there, are, there, are other, there, there are other documents, this is sort of part of a much bigger and overwhelming archival project, but there are, uh, cutting wood was a big sort of, Bulgarians and Macedonians were considered really good woodcutters at this point, so they, or you know, they were willing to do the woodcutting, and so they, uh, a bunch of people came in through New Orleans to do that kind of work, and it seems likely that this is what these guys are doing, they're going to cut the wood to make the whiskey barrels. Beaumont is a slightly different case, uh, but uh, it's, the closest, um, it's the closest town to Spindletop, which is the first uh, big oil strike in Texas, uh, in 1901, um, uh, the largest single oil well, in fact, of the era. Uh, and so the town closest to it grew f phenomenally in this period after 1901. And so there were jobs in construction, linking up the railroad, um, and various sort of, sort of short-term manual labor jobs, which again, it appears, these Macedonians in the middle of 1907 were filling. So that's, that follows these uh, guys through, um, but I want to go on now, finish with, with a continuation of this, um, uh, the, the work of uh, Grunberg's investigation um, in 1908 and, and the other reports that, uh, that followed it. Uh, so as I said, this spike in migration from Macedonia c intrigued the uh, Immigration Bureau in the US. And you gotta, this, is, this is at a period where there is this growing concern over immigration. It's 1907 is this peak year. There's all these concerns about, uh, uh, about the effect of all these Slavic uh, uh, immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe who are perceived as somehow lesser stock than, than Western European. 
And so John Gruenberg is, is one of the uh, people who, who is hired to do these kind of inspections. E.B. Holman, as I indicated before, did some investigations. Gogurovich worked with a translator, Alcibiades Serafik. Um, James Glucky uh, carried out an investigation in Toledo in 1908. But the other true specialist was Frank Garbarino, who uh, between 1907 and 1909 collaborated closely with an interpreter, Socrates Boucher, in major investigations into contract labor law violations in Steelton in 1908. Steelton, Pennsylvania, and St. Louis, Missouri in uh, 1909, and these both Bulgarian Macedonian cases. Uh, Garbarino's 1909 report reaches similar conclusions to those of Grunberg and others that a system was in place to recru recruit and exploit labor from the Balkans. Um, Boucher, his, his collaborator, was a key asset in this investigation. He was himself born in Monastir Obitola in 1876 and attended Greek schools there from 88 to 1896 before coming to the United States in 1900 and being hired by the Bureau in 1908. And Garbarino makes specific references to um, Boucher's old-time friendships with some of the steamship and labor agents from the same town, which actually facilitates his getting information about this traffic. Um, what Gabrino uncovered in the St. Louis investigation was an attempt to establish a new market for migration in the area around Prizren. As Gabrino describes it, it is quite a distance from the Monastir and Prelep districts where they've already uncovered these um, processes before. And it is natural to presume that the news of so many deportations, uh, which he's been instrumental in, in sort of shutting down various operations, the news of so many deportations did not reach the small villages around Prizren, and the agents understanding that, that business is likely to pick up considerably in this country as soon as the weather permits. This is nat has naturally sent their runners into this district to solicit business, also encourage the moneylenders, and have thereby succeeded in starting the present movement. So this is a story of, uh, of, of, of uh, forced migration of a rather different, in a different register from what we're used to. This is uh, uh, migration driven by commercial interests uh, of these agents. The consummate professional, Garbarino, included a map which he drew, he says, in consultation with Rand and McNally's map, uh, spelling the, the village names that weren't in that source phonetically. Um, he drew connections between the villages shown here through the agency of particular named individuals from this region, working with moneylenders and sub-agents stationed in local towns and cities, ultimately to Kingan's Meatpacking Company in Indianapolis. And although Garbarino himself, the federal employee, never traveled to Macedonia, he discovered that um, the general superintendent at Kingans, Mr. James Cunning, had done so a few years earlier, when after strikes among German and Irish workers, he had decided to, quote, give the Bulgarians a trial. And uh, Garbarino concluded his report by asserting strongly that for as long as the system stayed in place, which allowed these immigrants to come as cheap, disposable labor, manipulated by the middlemen, or padrones, as he called them, then they would become, in his words, shaped by the concerns of the time, the yellow peril of the Caucasian race. So I finish with this Garbarino report from 1909 because aside from this lurch into what looks like racism from the vantage point of the 21st century, it evokes so strongly the story of the Macedonians in Iraq with which I began. And the fact that Kumanovo is at the center of this uh, map I find compelling. In peacetime or wartime, it seems, in the industrial or post-industrial age, there is dangerous and menial work to be done as cheaply as possible and a global ethnic division of labor to do it. The process of recruiting such workers, though, is not straightforward and has its own political economy, which also yields profits for the individuals and agencies involved. So Sergio Tanguma, uh, who worked for Sufan Engineering, which did the grunt work of recruiting for Kellogg, Brown, and Root, is in this respect a direct descendant of the kinds of sub-agent employed by F. Missler and others to flaunt the promise of high wages in America to villages in America and sell North German Lloyd steamship tickets. So that's one part of the global proportions of this story, a story about class. But the other manifest in the individual stories of people like uh, John Gogurovich, which I went into in detail, and Socrates Boucher, which I touched on less, is about race. As I tried to tease out in the encounter between Gogurovich and Stump, a question mark seems to hang over these first-generation Americans from southeastern Europe, which their education, energy, and evident patriotism never seems to fully erase. The stories of these two men and others like them offer ground for a further study, uh, including their recorded efforts to assimilate. Gogurovich later proposes to change his last name because he recognizes that people can't spell it. Um, and Boucher went by Samuel rather than Socrates later in life. And the mismatch, uh, there's a clear mismatch between their symbolic and financial uh, rewards and their consistent high ranking by their superiors. 
they're middlemen of a different kind from the padrones they're studying, who it could be argued exemplify the world which James Clifford describes in Routes, where the salient question is not so much where are you from as where are you between. And that, it seems to me, is the world they want to be part of a hundred years ago, yet which the attitudes of their colleagues, whether adversaries or collaborators, deny them. And to zoom back out finally again to the anthropologists of small nations and the danger of limiting our horizons, um, I believe that if, if we can, the work that we can do can challenge the kind of essentialisms that, that, uh, that put these frontiers, uh, that sort of block these people uh, like Boucher and Gogurovich from crossing these frontiers. In other words, our work should be to, to sort of point to that rather than and reinscribe the borders that they were they were sort of running up against. Um, so I, I believe that even as we hone our expertise on Macedonia, we have a lot and possibly more than we think uh, to wider audiences. There's ground for investigation here. I think um, to continue, uh, 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 there's a there's a line of work on how the Irish became white, how the Jews became white, how the Italians became white. Uh, and I think there's, there's ground for uh, an investigation of how some Slavs or Balkan folks did and some didn't, um, and how perhaps uh, in conditions of post-socialism, whiteness gets undone. And I'm thinking here of uh, ways to connect this kind of work uh, with the, some of the work done by people like Gerald Creed and Janine Waddell, who are pointing out that the, the form of uh, the form of international intervention into the Balkans and Eastern Europe more generally, uh, given a sort of choice between a kind of Marshall Plan model of assisting democracy in Western Europe and a development model coming out of Africa and the Third World, inclines towards that latter world and, in other words, reinscribes the Balkans as, as outside Europe. So I want to conclude, though, with a, 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 a not quite a quote but an abuse of Paul Gilroy again. Uh, from this book, the, the Black Atlantic, and what I've done here is just substituted uh, for his um, for his uh, use of the, the adjective black to suggest uh, and argue that we could equally claim and we could undertake a study of the history of the Slavic or Balkan Atlantic, continually crisscrossed by the movement of Slavic or Balkan people, not only as commodities but engaged in various struggles towards emancipation, autonomy, and citizenship. And here I'm thinking of Boucher and Gogurovich. And, and that such a history provides a means to re-examine the problems of nationality, location, identity, and historical memory. Thank you.